this little reading is taken from a book that you all might have had opportunity to study. I think it was the common read for Unitarian Universalists um, last year. It's called Justice on Earth, People of Faith Working at the Intersection of Race, Class, and the Environment. And it's by co-editors Manish Mishra Marzetti and Jennifer Nordstrom. Um, and this little piece is the final reflection. It's taken from the final reflection by Manish Mishra Marzetti. The issues that we face as a nation today are just as great as what we confronted in the 1950s and the 1960s. At that time, we, we had to go deep within ourselves to see how we were complicit with structures of power, authority, and organization that were abusive and harmful. Collectively, as a nation, we responded to that challenge and made large-scale systemic changes that moved us toward being a better nation. We've tackled similarly entrenched problems before, and with courage and conviction, we must new do so again. Our spiritual commitment to human dignity and equality demands nothing less of us. I want to begin this speaking portion with a prayer of commitment from the UN Environmental Sabbath Program. If you'll join with me in the spirit of prayer. We join with the earth and with each other to bring new life to the land, to restore the water to refresh the air. We join with the earth and with each other to celebrate the seas, to rejoice in the sunlight, to sing the song of the stars. We join with the earth and with each other to recreate the human community, to promote justice and peace, to remember our children. We join with the earth and with each other. We join together as many and diverse expressions of one loving mystery for the healing of the earth and the renewal of all A girlfriend of mine once told me about a book. She had to tell me three times before I read that book. But it was a great book, a transformative book. It was called The Last Hours of Ancient Sunlight by Tom Hartman. Have any of you read that book, heard of it? It sort of tells our history. It explains how by burning fossil fuels, which are really ancient sunlight, deposited ancient sunlight, we are creating a greenhouse earth artificially and tragically. After reading that, suddenly I realized, not that I hadn't been toying with it in the back of my mind, but I realized that all the ministries all the justice work, all the anti-oppression work our congregations do will be pointless in some ways if there will be no livable earth. Yet Hartman signals hope when he writes, this is where all the matter of our world 
except hydrogen, came from. It was created in the heart of a star. Remember your awe at looking up at the night sky so long ago? Now look around this room and realize as you do it that everything you see here is matter which was created in the heart of a star, was blown back out into black, empty space when that star died and has come to be accumulated here is what we call planet Earth. And everything on it and in it, not only is the matter around you star stuff, but you are too. There's not a single cell in your body which is not made of matter formed in the heart and then the death of a distant and now extinct star. Not one cell. Every living thing on this earth is star stuff. And that's a good part of my theology, that we are all part of the same system created in a timeless cosmos. What we do to care for ourselves, to care for one another, for this earth, for the skies and the seas and all life on this planet is among the most important thing we can do. For thousands of years, thousands and thousands of years, cultures revered the earth and all of creation. Stewardship of the land and the creatures that roam these skies and earth and air and seas were treated with some amount of dignity and respect. And yet, some of these ancient cultures on the front lines of the devastating effects of climate change are moving towards extinction, as if their lives don't matter, those ancient respectful cultures, as if we aren't all composed of star stuff. We asked in the opening words, the Quaker query, what action are we taking to reverse the destruction of Earth's ecosystems and promote healing of the Earth? I think we all know that we can't do much alone, not that one person isn't important and one person's actions aren't important, but we can't do a good deal of the work in silos all by ourselves. We need one another to move and shape a response to the crisis, to bring justice to our earth healing work. You may wonder why I'm lifting up this date, but on August 26th, 2016, this congregation had a green team meeting. I saw the notes from that because Reverend Gay gave them to me. The notes of that meeting detailed that there were congregational plans, there were work projects in the community and there were structural areas that you planned to take on as a congregation, committed to environmental justice, taking seriously the seventh principle of Unitarian Universalism, respect for the interdependent web of all existence of which we are a part. Well, life happens, doesn't it? Life's happening to this congregation. You're going through lots of changes. But what better time to lift up something that happened before? Some of the people that were uh, advocating and organizing for the green team have moved on and 
gone on. But this morning, I thought we might explore together how this congregation can dig deeper and broader into building a vision of a new green team, the one that builds on the work possibly three years ago, but actively engages now with the UUA's Unitarian Universalist Association. Hate, hate that alphabet soup. So um, the Green Sanctuary Program. Now the Green Sanctuary Program, how many people have heard of the Green Sanctuary Program? Eh, a right good number of you. Well, the Green Sanctuary Program was formed in 1989. It empowers congregations to learn more about themselves, their communities, and how they are uniquely equipped to deal with the challenges that are in plain sight. We all know things that come up on how often a basis um, we hear in the news, things where we're disavowing the climate um, summits, where we're taking the land away, where people are on the front lines, all of those kind of things. Well, Green Sanctuary offers a few kinds of processes to lead to eventual accreditation if a congregation chooses. They challenge those things that we've heard about and work with the things that are right in plain sight and those other things that are hidden from us that we might not realize are happening. There are five steps to the Green Sanctuary Program. The first one, of course, before these five steps is exploring what Green Sanctuary is all about, looking on the website, finding out what it entails, part of this service here today. But then the steps are establishing a green team that provides some leadership in educating and organizing the congregation about the program and about how that might work out. It's important to understand that Green Sanctuary, although it, you may have a green team that kind of leads the way and has some leaders of it, it's a congregation-wide effort. It's not about a few people. It's that um, the congregation embraces uh, moving forward on being a green sanctuary and um, taking numerous steps and doing a lot of hard work, really. Now, the next stage is congregational assessments, where the congregation collects data about its usage of electricity and water and waste disposal and food and recommends probably a professional energy audit. Congregation members and friends also look at their own usage and calculate their environmental footprint. My husband works with this a lot um, in his work um, with a green team in Savannah. Um, but he helps people calculate how many earths does it take to support how, what our individual and collective needs are, what our family needs are, what our congregation's <coughs> needs are. How many earths do you have to use up to provide our needs? The next step after that is forming a congregational action plan, inspiring us to ask, how can we live our faith? How can we live our faith in a way that's best for the earth as well as for our community? The action plan includes projects in four areas. And this is what I love about Green Sanctuary. It's so holistic. It's so comprehensive because it looks at all aspects, not just one or two, but all kinds of aspects of our life in congregations and in communities. One of them is religious education. Religious education projects that the congregation would do work on shifting our understanding about what is at stake with climate change. And it also does as I imagine most of you know lifespan religious education. So 
religious education doesn't stop when you stop being a child it goes throughout all our whole life span and so the projects that we do focus on all the the kinds of um, life span religious education sustainable living projects also focus on being more mindful and aware of the resources we use and the choices we make and what the impact of those are. Worship and celebration, like our service today, grounds and connects us to the central place that stewardship plays in our lives. And environmental justice, the fourth area, reminds us that people on the margins bear the biggest impact and the burden of encroaching climate change and the environmental crisis that's in front of us now. Green sanctuary congregations move from doing charitable work to more of an emphasis on partnership and solidarity with those communities that are hardest hit by climate change. And that looks different in each community. That's why it's so individualized. Then the fourth and fifth steps are applying to be actually a green sanctuary candidate. And then the fifth step, gaining green sanctuary accreditation, joining the 254 or so congregations, approximately 25% of all the congregations that are Unitarian Universalists, and actually receiving that accreditation. And um, just to know that there are 70 more congregations that are currently in the process of becoming Green Sanctuary congregations, because this work may take some years. It's not like an immediate kind of thing. It re requires some commitment and diligence. And the scope of Green Sanctuary program is vast. Its vision is a world that is viable and just for humanity, and for the whole web of life, including present and future generations. And the resources at a congregation's disposal are also immense. There's a Green Sanctuary program manager, the Reverend Karen Brammer, <clears throat> who is part of the Unitarian Universalist Association staff, their Multicultural Growth and Witness Office. And she is available to congregations. There are coaches also to help congregations through the process. So you're not alone at all if you were to decide to embark on this journey again. There's also now, <clears throat> just started in the last year or so, an online portal that connects of people doing this important work. It may be Green Sanctuary congregations, but it's others, activists, uh, ministers, lay leaders, environmental, environmentalists, climate scientists, others that come together on this createclimatejustice.net portal um, to help work together and to share what they are doing, what others are doing, how they might work together. And then finally, there's the Green Sanctuary website, which is just accessible to everyone. It offers some great videos just little short videos, like an introduction to the Green Sanctuary program, which is real basic, but that's by Karen Brammer. The first environmental justice steps for white people, our place in the web of life, an introduction to environmental justice. And then this important question, why bother with environmental justice? So all those videos are available if you just go online and check that out on the Green Sanctuary website. Remember that book that I told you about, Last Hours of Ancient Sunlight? There's another aspect to that book and what he portrays that really excites me. He writes, all the available evidence from physics to psychology to common sense tells us that our actions now, today, this moment, 
are influencing everybody and every body and everything in creation. We are all connected. Every atom in a glass of water, every cell in our bodies that once existed in a star. Everything in this space is sacred and the space outside to your doors. May we cultivate this way of being to see the connected world and take actions that can revivify this earth and to cherish each strand of the delicate way of life. May it be so.